All right, everybody, welcome to Math with Grace. All right, in this video, we'll be covering Geometry, Book 1004, Section 3 from pages 52 to 63. Chapter 3, or sorry, Section 3 starts on page 52, and it's all about inequalities, okay? Remember, an inequality are things that aren't equal, okay? And they're restating that Theorem 4, 6 states that the base angles of an isosceles triangle are equal, right? And if we put that theorem into other words, we say if two sides of a triangle are equal, then the angles opposite those sides are equal, okay? If two sides are equal, the angles opposite them are equal. Well, the result of applying the contrapositive, remember those? is if two angles of a triangle are not equal, then the sides opposite them are not equal. Okay, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about inequalities. The figure at the right seems to show that if angle C is greater than angle A, then side AB is greater than side BC. Okay, do you see how they did that there? If angle C is the bigger of the two, then the side opposite angle C is the bigger side. And it makes sense, right? Because when we have an angle, we have to open it up. And the, the bigger it opens, so the larger the angle, the larger the piece that needs to connect the two ends together, right? Big angle, and it keeps getting longer and longer and longer, right? So if angle C is larger than A, angle A, then the side opposite it, the part that it's biting down on, right, is going to be larger than the part that A is connecting, okay, biting down on, right, that's what they're stating here, that's what they want you to understand. Now, here's the algebraic theorem, I'm going to read it to you, let's not get caught up on this at all. If A, B, and C are real numbers such that A is equal to B plus C, so A must be greater than B by itself, right? And A must be greater than C by itself, okay? Because to add the two together gives you A. It says that C must be a positive number, then A is greater than B, okay? That's what I just stated, right? If you took off the C, then A is greater than B. It can't be equal any longer because it needs the C to be equal, right? If you took it away, it would have to be that A is greater than B. All right, so let's take a look at how this works with geometry. Let's look at the model three on page 53. They want us to prove, or they're going to prove, that angle RAT is larger than, is greater than angle RAS. Okay, here's how they do it. Angle R A T is equal to angle R A S plus angle S A T, right? It's equal to the two things here because A S is between this, right? And that's just the angle addition theorem. How do we know that this is true? Because that's the angle addition theorem, right? We can add two angles together and make one larger angle. That's what the angle addition theorem is. That's why we know this is true. Then they say that angle SAT is a positive number because we can't have negative angles, right? There's no such thing. And that's that protractor postulate thing um, that we covered slightly. You're never almost ever going to have to use this in a, <laughs> in a theory or in a proof, I mean. Um, this is just a book proof. And remember, I said book proofs are weird sometimes. All right, then... They can say, because SAT is a positive number, they can say that angle RAT is greater than RAS because if A equals B plus C and C is greater than zero, then A is greater than B. And that is this our algebraic theorem here, but you're not just going to write algebraic theorem. You need to write out what that means, and here is how you write it out, okay? And honestly, if this part was left out, I wouldn't care. Um, if you just wrote, if A equals B plus C, then A is greater than B. 
if you wrote that in your proofs, I would be fine with that, okay? But know that C has to be greater than zero. And we're talking about geometry and there's really no negative space in geometry. So that leads us down here to the bottom of page 53 and theorem 4.9. Theorem 4.9 reads, if two sides of a triangle are not equal, then the angle opposite the longer side is the larger angle. And I'm sure there's an example on the next page, but I'm going to go ahead and draw it right here by the proof. And so if these are my sides, this one's 10, this one's 8, this one is 12, okay? It says... Two sides of a triangle are not equal. So let's get rid of the 12 because I got three sides technically listed here. Let's not get confusing. All right. Then the angle opposite the longer side, that's my 10, right, is the larger angle. The angle opposite my 10 is this one. Okay, it's the angle my 10 does not touch. The 10 touches this angle and this angle, but it does not touch that one. That's the one opposite. So in this case, this angle here is larger than this angle here because this one only had to open to 8 while that one had to open to 10, okay? That's what this proof or this theorem is stating. Turning the page to page 54, we have another theorem, theorem 410. And it reads, if two angles of a triangle are not equal, then the side opposite the larger angle is the longer side. Theorem 4.9, we were talking about the sides being larger, making the angle the largest angle, right? Now we're talking about an angle being the larger one and therefore having a longer side. If angle A for this drawing here is greater than angle M, Okay, then we can say this is opposite A, this is opposite M, right? We can say that side MD is greater than side AD. Okay, that's what they're saying. If this, then this, right? If angle A is greater than angle M, then side MD is greater than side AD. A, D. All right, and that leads us to a corollary, which is on page 55. And remember, all of this is on your theorems and postulates pages, and so make sure you're using those when you're doing your homework and your tests and your quizzes, all right, or your self-tests. But corollary one states, the perpendicular segment from a point to a line is the shortest distance from the point to the line. So what they're saying is if you have a line and a point, okay, a perpendicular segment is the shortest distance from this point to this line. That's all they're stating for their corollary, okay? So then they want to, to complete a proof that is based on that. So we're going to do that together. All right, for section three, book 1004, we're on page 55, and we're going to look at proof 3.1. We're given this um, shape here, and we're given the fact that PT is perpendicular okay, to RT, which is this line down here. And they want us to prove that PT is less than PR. Okay, so to do that, we start out by finishing my setup here. All right, now we're ready. Number one, we're going to list what? We're going to list our given information, right? That PT is perpendicular to RT. And RT is a line, that's why they're showing it in such a way. And why do we know that information true? Because it was given. Okay, so then for number two, we're going to use what they gave us and we're going to state something about angle T. We're going to say that angle T is a right angle. And why do we know that angle, oh, that's a two, why do we know that angle T is a right angle? We know that because perpendicular lines form right, right angles. 
right? Perpendicular lines form right angles. We know that. Now we've shown that angle T is a right angle. We marked it already on our, our drawing, but now we've proved it. Here's the part, here's the step we can take from what we just learned, okay? We can say that angle T is greater than angle R. And why is it that we can say it's true? Well, we can say it's true because right angles are greater than acute angles. And I know this is not something that we've done a proof for. That's why I'm doing this one with you because even though all of our reasons should be postulates and theorems, um, sometimes a book likes to throw weird stuff in here. So that's why I do the weird ones with you. With you. So we've stated that angle T is larger than angle R. I have yet to figure out a way to mark that on my drawing. If you are clever enough to come up with something, then please do so um, if it helps you. I have yet to figure out a way to do that. So it's just something I have to remember. So angle T is greater than angle R. Maybe I could do something like this greater angle R. So I want to mark the sides that they, because that's what we're going for, right? The sides that they represent. So that being said, I can now say that, oh, that PT is, well, let me write it the same way I wrote this. PR is greater than PT. It doesn't matter which way you write it. It's the same thing, okay? But I wrote T first here and R here. So I'm going to write them in corresponding order, right? Because angle T in this case corresponds with PR and angle R corresponds with PT. I can say that because of what we just learned, right? If two angles of a triangle are not equal, right? Then the side opposite the larger angle is longer. That one's kind of long, even when we try to abbreviate, but if two angles of a triangle are not equal, then the side opposite the larger angle is longer, okay? T is the larger angle, therefore the side opposite is larger than the, R, the PT. Okay, that's proof 3.1. All right, now we've done the first proof. We're going to turn over to page um, 56. And at the top, if you recognize, it's when we were talking about congruent triangles, right? It said if we had three sticks and, well, technically six sticks and each of each set matched, right? They were equal. We could create two equal triangles. Well, the question that they're posing here is, can you do that with any size sticks? What if you had a two inch stick and a 10 inch stick and an eight foot stick? Could you make a triangle out of that? Chances are pretty slim, right? Cause it's just the shape, the sizes are too large. They won't fit together, right? And so that's what theorem 4.0 11 is stating, it says, the sum of the length of any two sides of a triangle has to be greater than the length of the third side. This is the triangle inequality theorem. And this is what it looks like, basically based on this triangle down here, okay? The sum of the two sides, so they're saying AB and BC has to be greater than AC or this triangle won't work. Just like CA or AC plus AB has to be greater than BC or the triangle won't work. So looking at page 57, they're saying, remember that the sum of any two sides must be greater than the third side, okay? So if you look at the drawing on page 57, it says in the diagram below, the school, your home, and a friend's home represent the vertices of a triangle, right? The distance between home and school is less than the combined distance from school to home via your friend's house. 
So if you were to leave school and need to walk home, if you actually went to a building for school, um, stopping by your friend's house is going to take longer, or it should anyway, if this is a true triangle. The shortest path is home. If you went to your friend's house and then home, that should be longer if this is a real triangle. So let's take a look at some of these problems they have. So in section three on page 58, um, for number 3.2, they want us to write the angles according to size from smallest to largest. So these little symbols here don't say, don't represent the angle itself. They're saying that this angle is less than this angle, which is less than this angle. So smallest, the next one, the largest. That's how they want you to write it, okay? And they gave you this drawing with the lengths of the sides. Now remember, each side corresponds to the angle that it doesn't touch. So for the side that's the eight, it corresponds with angle C because it doesn't touch angle C. For the three, it corresponds with angle B because that's the only angle it doesn't touch. And for the seven, it corresponds with angle A because that's the only angle it doesn't touch. Now, as we talked about, the smaller the angle, or the, sorry, the smaller the size, the smaller, the smaller the size of the side, the smaller the angle. I'm gonna get it out here eventually, right? Because this angle didn't have to open very big to make a three, right? It's So it must be the smallest. Whereas this angle had to open a little bit more to make seven. And this angle, of course, had to open the widest to make an eight. So our smallest angle is angle B. All right, our next smallest angle is angle A. And this, the largest angle of this triangle is angle C. All right, that's how they want you to do those next few problems. Um, so you go ahead and tackle those. I'm going to take a look at 3.6 next. For 3.6, 7 and 8 for that matter, they want us to write the sides according to size from largest to smallest. So just like I did here, I'm first going to draw my arrows so that I know what corresponds to what. I know that this 90 degree angle corresponds with MO. I know that this 30 degree angle corresponds to PO. And I know that this 60 degree angle corresponds with PM. Okay, Remember, it's the angle corresponds with the side that it doesn't touch. Right, this angle touches this side and this side, but not that. So that's the side it corresponds with. Just basically the opposite of what we did there. This time though, they want us to start with the greatest one, then then the next greatest, and then the smallest. So the greatest side is gonna be opposite or correspond with the greatest angle. And in this case, our greatest angle is P at 90 degrees. And the side that corresponds with that is MO. Right now, the next greatest after that is the 60 degree angle, and this 60 degree angle corresponds with the side PM. And finally, our smallest side corresponds with our smallest angle, and that's this 30 degree one, which corresponds with PO. Okay, that's how we do those, um, and that's how we set them up. I want to take a look next at number three nine and three ten i'm just going to fit them onto this page because i don't feel like wasting another sheet of paper but what three nine through three fourteen is asking is can you construct a triangle with this size sticks basically with this size these sides for sides can you construct a triangle and here's how we set that up to find out remember what I said on page da, 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 57, the sum of any two sides must be greater than the third. So for this to actually be a triangle, three plus four has to be greater than five, right? Seven is greater than five, check. Well, we also have to say that three plus five has to be greater than four. Is that true? Eight is greater than four, so yes. One more side, don't 
forget to check all of your sides. We also have to say that is five plus four greater than three. Nine is greater than three. So yes, we could construct a triangle out of these size sides or sticks, all right? So let's look at 310. And they give you um, unit of measure. Unless your units of measure don't match up, then disregard them for now, okay? Unless they give you feet and inches in the same thing, obviously, right, we have to work with the same unit of measure, but here they give you the same unit of measure for all the sticks, so don't get tangled up in um, the units of measure. So we've got six feet, 12 feet, 17 feet, I don't care, that's a huge triangle if it works, but that's not the point. We don't care if they're feet or inches or millimeters, honestly. What we care about is, does this work? Are two sides added together always greater than the third side? So let's see. Six plus 12, is that greater than 17? Well, six plus 12 is 18. 18 is greater than 17. So check. What about six plus 17? Is that greater than 12? I'm running out of paper. Six plus 17 is 23, which is greater than 12. So check. And what about 12 plus 17? Is that greater than six? I don't even need to do the math, right? Because each of those numbers is greater than six. So of course, added together, they're gonna be greater than six. So yes, we could make a humongous triangle out of a six foot, a 12 foot, and a 17 foot stick, okay? Now, that these are the steps that you need to take. One, two, three for each one of these problems as, as you go forward through 14, okay? That's the steps you need to take. If any one of these don't work out, then you can't make a triangle out of it. That's just it. Now, there aren't that many left to do. I don't wanna do any more and spoil the fun, um, but make sure for each one, you're doing each of the three steps. If one of the three steps does not work, no triangle for you, okay? Good job. Okay, proof time. We're gonna look right now at proof 324 on page 60. We're given these two segments, all right, as our drawing, and we're given the information that BC is equal to EF. And they want us to prove that AC, which is this entire segment, is greater than EF, all right? So, always and forever, number one, BC is equal to EF. Why do we know that to be true? Because it is our given information, all right? Given information, always gonna be step one. Step two, okay? Now we've got to develop some kind of relationship. We've got to get to AC. At this point, all we've talked about is BC, only part of AC. So we need to get to talking about AC, and here's how we do it. AC is equal to AB plus BC, right? Just looking at the drawing, you can see that that is a true statement, right? These two parts are all one segment, so added together, they equal the full segment. And what is that called? That's called the betweenness which we don't use nearly enough, or the additive, right? Additive property, same thing. Betweenness, additive property. I like betweenness because it's a ridiculous word. Okay, so that gives us number three. Now we have our AC established, okay? We've got it set up. And we can say that AC, oh, not equal to anymore, we have an inequality going on here, is greater than BC, right? We want to relate AC and BC because BC gets us to EF. That's where our given information, right? BC has a relationship with EF. So if we can relate AC to BC, we can eventually get AC related to EF, okay? So we can say that AC is greater than BC because we just learned that if A equals B plus C and C is greater than zero, then 
A is greater than B. Remember that? We just talked about that, that uh, algebraic theorem. That's going to be our answer, right? Because here we had AC equals AB plus BC. We had this set up. We took away C so that AC must be greater than BC, all right? This was our constant we removed. Now AC is greater than BC. Now we have a relationship established between AC, which is what we're going for, and BC. We already established a relationship between BC and EF. So what do we do? Everywhere we see a BC, what are we going to write? We're going to write an EF. So now we can say AC is greater than EF. And what is that called when we switch out something for an equivalent? That's right, it's called substitution, okay? Substitution. We substituted EF where we saw BC because they are equivalent. They are equal. They're the same thing. So it can be substituted out, all right? Substitution. Let's take a look at proof um, 327. All right, so proof 327 is on page 61. We're given this illustration, this drawing, right? And we're given the information that Wx is greater than xy. And we want to prove that angle 1 is greater than angle 4. Angle 1, what we should notice right off the bat, Angle one is what's called that remote exterior angle, right? It's an exterior, not remote, but exterior angle. And remember, when we put our thumb over our exterior angle, we know that it's equal to the two remote interior angles that are left. Remember that when we learned that a couple weeks ago? One is exterior. If we put our thumb over it, it's equal to the other two angles that are inside of the triangle. So that's going to be our um, our way to get a relationship between angle one and angle four, okay? And I know you're thinking, but you just covered up angle four. I did cover up angle four, but our given information gives us a relationship between angle four and angle three. Let's take a look at how that works. So number one, it's gonna tell us that Wx is greater than xy. Why do we know this to be true? Because it is our given information. What does that given information tell us? It tells us that Wx, which corresponds with angle three, is larger than xy, which corresponds with angle four. So what can we deduce from that information? Well, we can say that angle three is greater than angle four, right? Here is the side that corresponds with angle three, and here's the side that corresponds with angle four. We can just switch those through because we know that we just learned that angles opposite the larger side or the longer side are larger this should say longer longer so angles opposite the longer side is the larger angle right that's what we just learned in this section. So now we've set up a relationship between angle three and angle four. Okay, here's our four, we're getting there. Now we need to set up that relationship I talked about with angle one and angle three. And we do that by saying angle one is equal to angle two plus angle three, right? Because we know that that's true because the exterior angle is equal to the sum of remote interior angles, right? If we, it's an exterior angle. If we put our thumb over it, we know it's equal to the sum of the remote interior angles. Okay, we learned that a couple weeks ago. So now we have the start of our relationship between angle one and angle three. But this stinking angle two is in the way and we need to boot him out of there, okay? Here's how we do that. Step four, we're going to say that angle one is greater than angle three. And why do we know that? We just learned it, right? And we just used it in the last proof. If A equals B plus C and C is greater than zero, then A is greater than B. Okay, two was my C. I booted it out. 
showing that angle one is greater than angle three. Now we've got a direct relationship between angle one and angle three, and we have a direct relationship between angle three and angle four. So now every time we see a three, what are we gonna write? Yes, we're gonna write a four. So for step five, we're gonna write angle one is greater than angle four. And why can we say that that's true? Through substitution. Okay, substitution, and your book might say, if you have an answer key, might say transitive property. I don't know why they throw that in there sometimes. Substitution and the transitive property are basically the exact same thing, so don't get confused. If you wrote substitution and you see transitive property in your answer key, they're basically the exact same thing. So that's how we worked through Proof 327. Uh, let's see and do 28 next. They don't give you the information, so I'm going to work through that one with you. All right, so if you look at page 62, proof 328, you'll see that they didn't give you the given or the proof again. So I'm doing it for you. Please note that the given information is that ABC is a right triangle and that we want to prove that AC is greater than AB, so basically the hypotenuse, right, is greater than AB, and AC is also greater than BC. We've got two different things to prove here, all right? So that's why there's so many lines on this proof. But let's go through them together one at a time. Always and forever, our first thing is going to be that triangle ABC is a right triangle. Now, um, I'm going to have to try to write small because I want to make sure I fit all this on here. Hopefully you can still see it okay. What is the reason that we can state that that is true? It's because it was given information, right? All right, number two. Having that being said, we have a right triangle. A right triangle tells us what? That at least that it has one right angle, right? Well, angle B is a right angle. How can we say that that's true? Why do we know that that's true? Because right triangles have one and only one, remember, one right angle. Remember that statement or postulate or theorem, whichever one it was? Right triangles have one and only one right angle. So now that we've stated that B is our right angle, I'm gonna mark it as such. Now, we need to get in this case, over to um, algebraic equations, right? We're trying to prove uh, inequalities. The only way we can prove inequalities is to get this into some type of equation. And that's where we're gonna start here. And we're gonna start by saying angle B is equal to 90 degrees. Now we're into equations. See how we did that? We stated that it's a right triangle, and then we were able to switch it over to an equation because we know that right triangles are 90 degrees, right? That's the definition of a right angle, okay? We stated that B is a right angle, therefore we can say that it's equal to 90 degrees, move over to an equation, because that is the definition of right angles. Right angles equal 90 degrees, that is the definition. All right, now we're into um, equations. This is where we're gonna build off of, and these, this is a weird proof, um, which is why we're doing it together. Number four, the next step that we need to take Remember, we're trying to get a relationship between AC and the other sides, but we're doing it, it looks like, with the angles, right? So we're developing relationships with angles, so we want to stay on that path. Because we have a right triangle and a right angle, what does that tell us about the other two acute angles? Well, the two acute angles of a right triangle equal 90 degrees, right? So we can say that 90 degrees is equal to angle A plus angle C, All right? We know that these other two angles added together equal the other 90 degrees of this triangle. It can only have 180 degrees altogether. So the reason that we can say that that's true is the acute angles of a right triangle are 
complementary. Right? Okay, now let's get this into an inequality. Step five, 90 degrees is greater than angle A. What did we just do there? We booted out angle C, right? Right now we're just gonna focus on angle A. 90 degrees is greater than angle A if A plus, or no, sorry, not A plus B. If A equals B plus C and C is greater than zero, then A is greater than B, okay? We're gonna use this postulate, this theorem quite a bit, that algebraic theorem. We're gonna use it quite a bit. Now we've established a relationship between 90 degrees and A and between 90 degrees and B. So what can we do? We can substitute, right? So number six, we're gonna say that angle B is greater than angle A. Where we had our 90 degrees, we substituted angle B. And so our reason for that is substitution. Okay, we're getting there, right? Now we know that angle B is greater than angle A. And if the arrows help, let's draw them in. Ah, like that, right? So we know that angle B is greater than angle A. So we can say that AC is greater than BC right? B corresponds with AC. A corresponds with BC. So we can write it that way and just say that the side opposite the larger angle is longer, okay? The side opposite the larger angle is longer, right? AC is opposite B, so it's larger than BC. All right, now we've proven this part. We can check that part off. Let's get back now to the next part. And for number eight, we take it takes us all the way back to step five. We're just gonna do step five again. Now, yes, technically we could have done them in the same row, but I, we're trying to make sure you can see what's happening here. We're gonna say that 90 degrees is greater than angle C. And we're gonna say that for the exact same reason we put for reason five. If A equals B plus C, and C is greater than zero, comma, then A is greater than B. Okay, this time we booted A, right? We went from step four here and we booted A out, and now we have a relationship between 90 degrees and C. Now that we have that relationship between 90 degrees and C, we can substitute for our relationship here and say that angle B is greater than angle C. And again, it's for the same reason we said here, right? Substitution. We substituted where we saw a 90 degrees, we substituted angle B. And finally, 10 steps. Whew. Now you can see where we could have combined some of these, right? We could have combined step five and eight. We could have combined step nine and six. We could have combined step seven and, you know, be done. But they wanted, that's why there's so many steps here. They wanted you to see each part separately. So angle B greater than angle C. So we can say that AC is greater than AB because AB is the side that it corresponds with angle C. And we can say that because the side opposite the larger angle is longer. All right. It's a huge proof. I know it seems daunting, but you know that we could combine, we could have combined some of these. We could have combined those. We could have combined those. We could have combined these and had three less steps for this proof, but they wanted you to see each part broken down. So this proof had two steps. It had this step or had two proofs. They wanted you to do two different things, prove two different things, so they wanted them broken out separately. In this particular case, we could have put them together and combined some of these steps, but that's fine. Sometimes they will ask you to prove two different things, and so you need to make sure you're taking steps toward choose one 
and do that, then go back and do the other, okay? I wanna take a look at one more problem in this section and then we're done. All right, so the problem I wanna look at is problem number 29. Um, hold on one second here. I didn't want to have to write out that whole thing. So here's 29. Two sides of a triangle have lengths of 10 and 15. So if we draw some triangle, we've got a 10 and a 15, right? Between what two numbers does the length of the third side, which we don't know, have to be? Okay, we know that any two sides added together must be greater than the third, right? So here's how we figure this out x plus 10 has to be greater than 15, right? And x plus 15 has to be greater than 10. As well as, I don't want to run out of book here, 15 plus 10 has to be greater than x, right? That is what we talked about before, right? When we want to make a triangle, these are the stipulations. So let's solve for x. Here, 10 is being added, so we're gonna subtract 10 from both sides. So in this situation, x must be greater than five, okay? Here's what we know. X must be greater than five for this to work. What about this one? 15 is being added, so I'm gonna subtract 15. X must be greater than negative five. Now, can we have a negative angle? No, we can't. So this one just doesn't work at all. We don't have to consider that at all because we can't have a negative angle to begin with. What about here? We have 15 plus 10, which is 25 greater than X. So X has to be less than 25. So between what two numbers? Well, between five, right? X has to be greater than five but less than 25, right? It has to come between these two numbers, between five and 25. So you could write it like this, between five and 25, okay? It can be as small as a six, it can be um, as great as a 24, but it, any larger than that, because it can't be five, right? It's gotta be less, or not less than five, greater than five, thought that looked weird. Has to be greater than five. It can't be five. It has to be greater than five. It can't be 25. It has to be less than 25. So it can be 5.5 .5 to 24.5 or whatever, but it could be 10. It could be six. It can be 18, but it can't. It has to be greater than five and less than 25. Okay. So that's the answer for 29. That one's a little bit confusing. I figure if I do it with you, then that'll set you up and get you prepared um, for the rest of those math problems. That's all I have for this section. If you have any questions, you can, you know how to get a hold of me um, and you can meet me in my office hours. Uh, otherwise, until next time.